thank you all for allowing us to share this platform with you. Of course, you know, in terms of compassion and equity, that's the hallmark of SBC. And I had the pleasure of meeting Haley Moss about two years ago um, when I was thinking about a program on diversity and inclusion and access. I happened to just literally send her an email and text her and she responded back quick, quickly. And it's been very interesting getting to know such a lovely young lady who acknowledges um, challenges, obstacles, triumphs, and how she is navigating being a person living with ASD and how she is educating the public and our legal profession about how to better engage with um, people who have accessibility um, differences. And so I'm just honored that Haley is here and I'm gonna take, let her take the floor because she is um, quite versed in um, talking with people. She leads some of our CLE programs for the Florida Bar and she teaches around the state and is a well-known author in this space. So Haley, thank you so much for your time today. Um, I hope that you get around to questions and I know um, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to get to be here and get to spend a little bit of time with everyone and talk about neurodiversity, disability, some stuff about ableism and whatnot as well. So we're about to get started and ready for the next slide. Thank you. So we wanna talk about accessibility for all of us before we get started. So inclusion and access is something I take really seriously. This is something that we all do together. As you may be aware that today's talk is being recorded and we also have wonderful ASL interpreters here with us today. So thank you to our interpreters and thank you to everyone for recording and whatnot. So I'm aware that we are allowed to have our cameras on and whatnot, but what I want you to know is you have no obligation to me to have anything on. And I'm aware that it's also lunchtime. So please do and honor whatever feels best for your brain and body today. So if you need to take a break, you need cameras off, you wanna go eat something, have a snack, whatever it might be, go for it. This is a judgment-free zone and it's really important to put your access needs at the forefront. As for copies of slides, they are available to you and they also have alt text and should be screen reader accessible as well. So without further ado, we're going to get our show on the road with our next slide. And just a little bit more about me since I know Kim did a quick introduction, but I just wanted to share a little bit as well. So I am autistic, I'm an attorney. I was diagnosed with autism when I was three years old. And back in the nineties, it was a very different time with how we talked about autism and related disabilities. I fast forward a little bit because I want to really get to the content. I am an attorney by trade and an educator by choice. I graduated from University of Miami's law school three and a half years ago. I briefly practiced in healthcare law before taking the leap to get to be an educator by choice. So most of what I do is, I, is consulting and I get to lead CLEs and I get to have all sorts of really fun discussions to help elevate the voices of people with disabilities and who are neurodivergent as well. For those of us who are attorneys, I do represent Miami-Dade at the Florida Bar Young Lawyers Division Board of Governors. I am honored to get to represent the concerns and efforts of young lawyers in their first few years of practice or who are under about 36 years old. I do teach at the college level in the psychology department with future disability service professionals. And as you heard, I'm also an author. Next slide. So to kind of jumpstart our understanding, I wanted to talk about what is disability since disability is a really broad category. And the law gives us this answer that disability is physical and mental impairment that substantially limits a major life activity. That's a pretty broad definition and major life activities encompass a lot of different things. I purposely use this definition because it covers a whole host of different things, whether it's what we think of as traditional disabilities that might impact our hearing or our vision or mobility. It does also include health conditions, neurological differences, brain-based differences, and also people who have non-apparent disabilities like a chronic illness or a complex medical need as well. But we're going to really focus on neurodiversity today. Next slide. And when we talk about neurodiversity, I want us to be thinking about how we all have different brains. That's a good thing. So when we say we have different brains, I'm saying that we all process the world around us differently, whether we're neurotypical and our brains work in the way that we expect them to, or 
we're neurodivergent and our brains work outside of this idea of normal. And we're talking about how we might communicate differently, process the world around us. So to me, the world is a very bright and crowded place. It might not seem that way to you, but everything feels very loud, very crowded and very bright. Those are some of the sensory differences that I have because of my autism. And I also sometimes struggle with stuff like executive functioning, prioritizing stuff and making sure that I am able to do things that feel pretty adult. So sometimes life feels harder with autism than it has to be. And people who are neurodivergent as well have a huge different list of conditions, but some of that does include other autistic people, folks who might have ADHD, learning disabilities, Tourette syndrome, intellectual disabilities, mental health and psych disabilities, and also our acquired cognitive differences and disabilities. Disability and neurodiversity are two of the only marginalized groups that you can join at any point in your life if you are lucky enough to be alive for a long time. So a lot of us get disabilities related to age, or it could just be a split second freak accident type thing, or you were just born that way. It really does depend. Next slide. I wanna talk a little tiny bit about etiquette, mostly because I know when we talk about disability and we talk about neurodiversity, we think that once we know to just be nice to people or we think that what we're supposed to do is just don't stare, don't say anything really mean or just offer assistance whenever it needed. So it's a little bit deeper than that when we talk about how we talk about disability and how we treat people. So. I always tell folks to try to avoid euphemisms. So I usually get my gears grinded when people refer to me as having special needs. My needs aren't special, they're just human. Sometimes I just might need a little bit more support to get there. And generally speaking, the way that we talk about ourselves might look different than how you talk about yourself. So there's this lack of consensus in the community of if we're saying we're people with disabilities, which is person first, or disabled people, which is identity. So depending on who you're talking to, they might use one or the other or both. I use them interchangeably. So I use having autism, autistic and disabled and people with disabilities all interchangeably to mean similar things. But depending on the person you're with, they might have a preference for one over the other. I personally will refer to myself as autistic because I can't seem to separate myself from the autism, no matter how hard I try, it's not some trendy accessory that I could just put down or that I could leave behind when I go to the beach. So that in mind, I wanna talk about how we have unique cultures. So disability culture is really interesting at times. The way that I connect with other neurodiverse people is different than how I interact with my neurotypical colleagues and friends. And also what happens is the way that typical non-disabled people treat us is very different than how we treat each other. Typically, when someone gets a new diagnosis or discovers something about themselves, non-disabled people will say, I'm so sorry. And in disabled communities, we will just say, I hope that brings you peace or I am, I hope you must be so relieved to have an answer to why this thing must have been hard for you, or maybe you're able to understand yourself and get the support you need. That it's a very different way that we talk to each other. We also, of course, have boundaries. And sometimes people are very quick to violate mine. It's something that I'm working on personally as well. And treat us like people. We don't have to be treated like perpetual children that you should be presuming confidence wherever you can. I know coming from academic affairs, sometimes it's hard. And when we talk about people, I think it's really important. And yeah, treat us like people. I know that seems kind of like common sense sometimes, but giving us the proper respect and dignity as adults that we are is something that's really important. Also, there's a big tendency to offer assistance to disabled people and neurodivergent people. A lot of the help that I get offered is help that I don't want and help that I don't actually need. When that happens, I usually will say something like, thank you, but I got this. And people insist on helping me with the thing I don't actually need help with, or they will give me help on something I never asked for help with. So when you ask for help, when you offer help, if someone says no, don't insist. They are trusting themselves and they probably know their body and brain better than you do. We all know ourselves and should have that confidence to be able to express our needs and wants and desires as we keep going. Next slide. Which brings us to this idea of ableism. 
is ableism is pretty sneaky in our society and amongst ourselves. We think it's something we're avoiding because we you know treat people nicely, ask for help. That's what we've been taught. But ableism is a lot more complex because it's something that we all have different biases and something that we've probably all reckoned with at some point in our lives. I know this is something that I'm still personally dealing with too, but ableism really is this idea of stuff that devalues and discriminates against people with disabilities and rests on the assumption that we need to be fixed in one form or another. In other words, we're not fully human or the disability is the problem with our existence and we need to be not moral failures or broken people, that this is causing that. And with ableism, it's really baked into our culture with limiting beliefs about what disability is or is not, how people learn to treat us. And the biggest thing is when it comes to major decisions, we're often not included at that table. We're not the ones who are seen as decision makers. In the autistic community and the autism community, what seems to happen especially is when you look at who the stakeholders are, you usually hear a lot from parents, professionals, siblings, everybody but the autistic people. Making sure that we're part of our own conversation is something really important. We tend to assume a lot about what people need without actually talking to them. We can definitely do better. And that's something that makes me really excited for our future. Next slide. So when we talk about ableism, I want us to think about some of the biases that we might be holding. It's okay if you hold these, we're gonna try to unpack them as best we can, or hopefully you feel empowered to tackle them and unpack them on your own. So some of these examples might be things like that you see us or view us as being lazy and helpless or that disability is our own fault, that we might be a burden to others or we're a drain on resources. You might immediately see someone with a disability or encounter them and your gut reaction is sympathy or pity you assume that deaf people can read lips or something that's a little bit less obvious, such as the language that we use has a lot of ableism baked into it. Something I'm personally trying to do is stop saying the word crazy. That sounds a lot easier than it is because we use words like crazy quite often. And I'm trying to stop that because a friend of mine who has a mental health disability told me how harmful it is and it reduces her experiences. I don't wanna inadvertently hurt my friends. But when I try to do this, and I'm really trying to do this, it's hard to avoid because it's all throughout our culture and other people. It's not as obvious as this might be damaging the same way that something like the R word might be. And something else I know we spend time in both physical and digital spaces is accessibility is often seen as an afterthought. We do have closed captions available and all of that good stuff for you. But typically that's something I've gone to enough meetings and virtual events that I have to be pretty demanding for. And it honestly, accessibility benefits everybody. It shouldn't be an afterthought when it helps every single one of us in order to succeed and get what we need. Or maybe we didn't realize that we can benefit as well. Next. Which brings me to other things that we do that are also ableist and difficult. So I'm going to give my top three of things that people say to me or have said to me that are microaggressions when we talk about microaggressions rooted in ableism is people will say something like, well, everybody's a little autistic. We're all on the spectrum. Let me unpack that really quickly. We're not all autistic. We're not all on the spectrum. And that also minimizes the challenges that I have and the things that are really hard for me. I really wish that you were instead viewing me as a whole person and understanding that some things are really hard for me. They might be hard for you, but they're also hard for me because of something else as well. The other big one, I never would have known if you didn't tell me. Not all disabilities are visible or apparent to you. Just because it's not apparent to you doesn't mean it's not apparent to me in my daily life. I'm also working really hard to make sure that I appear as socially confident as possible because I want that conditional acceptance. This in neurodivergent communities is something called masking. It particularly is a form of behaviors and a set of coping skills that we use to act and appear more neurotypical to avoid all sorts of adverse consequences. So to help us make friends, avoid bullying, avoid profiling by police, to avoid potential predators and assault, all sorts of different things are reasons why we do this. It's something that data usually shows happens with disabled and neurodivergent women and neurodivergent people of color. And it usually is a survival skill. It can happen for anyone, but those are some of the main motivations there. And number three on my list is 
Why don't you get that? It's so easy. There are lots of things that are easy for me that are really hard for you. I will not say this to you. And there are things that are really hard for me that are really easy for you. Everybody has different strengths and weaknesses. And it can be really tough to assume that. And when people say, why can't you do that? Or why don't you understand when it's so easy? It makes me feel incompetent and really frustrated with myself. And that's something that it kind of speaks to this idea of internalized ableism that's super difficult. So one thing that I personally still can't really understand is I am not very gifted when it comes to using the hair straightener and the blow dryer. I am trying my best and I have been working on this for the better part of half my life at this point. I've been trying since I was a teenager to get it down to a science and it still doesn't seem to go the way that I want it to. But the other women in particular will always tell me like, well, that's so easy because they've been doing it perfectly since they were in high school. And it's not easy for me because I have different motor skills. I struggle a little bit more, but it's something that just because it's easy for you doesn't mean it's easy for me. And it re these all rest on the assumption that we need to act more neurotypical, which doesn't really help anybody for that matter. Next. Which brings me to how can we actually encourage people to be more authentic without necessarily acting more neurotypical. When we deal with students and each other, there's reasons that people do disclose and people, reasons they don't. People have this feeling that they're obligated to if things aren't going right, they need accommodations, their academic performance is slipping, there was a mental health episode, a change in life circumstances. You've been adapting your whole life by yourself without assistance and all of a sudden it's just too much. Or you're like me and you just pretty much tell everybody when it feels appropriate, of course. I like bringing my full self everywhere I go. I'm proud to be neurodivergent. I'm proud to be autistic. I can't imagine being in a different brain and body to save my life, honestly. I want to be proactive and limit misunderstandings primarily because I'm usually afraid I'm gonna miss some form of some fundamental social cue. And that is just awkward for everybody. So if you know, maybe you'll be able to help me from there. And I also view neurodiversity as a strength. It's a strength for us because we all work better with different kinds of minds. It benefits all of us to be able to have different perspectives and realize there's more than one way of processing the world around us. Next. So when we talk about accommodations, I know that's the big thing that we're probably thinking about too. I want us to think about what we're told. So the ADA really prohibits discrimination against people on the basis of disability. This is actually broken up into several different titles. And Title I of the ADA in particular really does focus on employment, so you don't have to disclose unless you need an accommodation, and employers, including the university, will have to provide you with reasonable accommodations, except when it causes an undue hardship. Basically, if it's too expensive or it's just impossible. Next. So we talked about encouraging authenticity a little bit, and one of the biggest things that happens is a roadblock is people don't disclose that they have a disability. So let's kind of think about why people aren't sharing. Why might this be something that's hidden in shame, not just because of ableism or stigma, but also our own beliefs and understanding. So something that happens is that disability disclosure is super situational and also a pretty personal decision. The way that I disclose to any job that I've ever had is very different than how I used to tell my professors and teachers is very different than how I talk about my disability with my friends, very different than how I talk about it in real talk with my parents and family, and also probably looks extremely different than how I would talk about it on a first date. Let's just talk about that for a minute because that's very situational. So how I would disclose interviewing versus on a date versus with my friends or just having those conversations really is situational. And people don't disclose for a variety of different reasons, but here's some of the ones that really come up a lot is no one wants to be seen as less than or weak. We don't want to be seen as that when we're receiving an accommodation, we're somehow special or above it all. That was something that happened to me in school. My law school did not provide me with reasonable accommodations that I requested, and they weren't really willing to work with me. But because of my disability, my peers thought that I received every accommodation in the book. So they thought that I was special and had an unfair advantage when really I was just struggling to do the best that I could and doing everything in my power to say, I'm gonna survive. I am not going to drop out. It is going to be hard, but I am gonna get through this. We also have something called internalized ableism where we be begin to believe all the difficult stuff about our disability and all the negative associations that other people 
place on us. This is something I'm still really, really working through. And it's really tough and we all deal with this whether or not we're aware of it. We of course have our pre-existing stereotypes and discrimination on the basis of disability. And for those of us who might also be in jobs or something like me when I was going through the bar, you're afraid about disclosure because of concerns with your licensing. You're afraid that you might get treated differently or be told that you're unfit to practice or be a professional in some way. Next. I wanna talk a little bit more about internalized ableism for a minute. And just because that is something so difficult for a lot of us to process is this idea. I wanted to show kind of what some of that looks like. And this guy on our slide is sharing some of the big common things that happen with internalized ableism is thinking things like I'm broken, this is wrong with me, or that you're a burden and that you're asking for too much when you're just trying to get the assistance you need. You think that you're not good enough or that you'll never get a job or something of that nature. Because of the way that I studied and processed information, I spent my entire like higher education career thinking I was just unmotivated, lazy, and stupid. Just because of the way that I processed information. I would memorize everything and I would be able to write a lot faster than I can do anything else. I also can't take notes very well to save my life. Mostly because if I'm taking notes, I can't focus on what's going on and I feel like I lose something and it's really difficult for me. So I'd always think that I'm failing in some way, shape or form. There's also this idea that you feel like you have to prove people wrong on the statistics when it comes to disability. So I would always take on more than I can handle sometimes just to prove that I deserve to take up space, especially in school, that I would join every student organization. I would take leadership positions. I would volunteer. I would do everything just to prove that I was capable, not to myself, but to show to others that I deserve to take up space here. It shouldn't have to be that way. Next. Which brings me to when we talk about accessibility and accommodations a little bit more. And of course, we don't want to do our undue hardship when we think about those of us who are here at SBC, that receiving workplace accommodations for us is generally pretty cheap. We know for our students, it's probably even less of a financial drain or burden. So most accommodations don't cost anything to implement. It just requires a bit of planning. We might have to go through HR here and for students, what Ever disability support is available to them. So something that I've had to learn the hard way going through school is that the accommodations offered to me weren't often the ones that I needed. I was always offered extra time, but I always finished my assignments and work on time. I didn't realize that I can ask for something else. So for those of us who are working with students, we should get creative. I would have really benefited from the university note-taking services because I did struggle so much with that, but I didn't know I was allowed to ask for that. I thought that was for certain other disabilities. And the truth is every single person is different. And we need to make sure that's an option for our students and for ourselves. That the accommodations that I used when I was in office life is I used to wear headphones every day, mostly because my office was very bright because I had fluorescent lights. They hummed all day, they were very bright. It gave me headaches, it was a disaster. So that is why I would wear headphones and my boss and I came up with that solution because it would have been an undue hardship to replace every single light in the building, which brings me to some of our next slides as well. I am very proud of being autistic and I'm very honest about that. But I realize again that not everyone can. And when we're talking about asking for accommodations, you have to be open to some extent. And for me, being open means I don't have to hide or mask my autism and I have the freedom to be exactly who I am. I know when people are going to be mean, I know when people are difficult and that's okay. And I feel like that's a great thing for me. And I really do, I'm looking at the chat as well. And I do appreciate that some of us are chatting and sharing as well. And I'm really excited to get to engage with you after as well. I just wanted to mention that and I appreciate everybody for joining us yet again. So we're gonna shift gears just a little bit. And then we're gonna of course talk questions. We're gonna talk through things a little bit more and making sure that I reserve some time for everybody. So next slide, we're going to talk about self-advocacy for just a couple of minutes, and then we're going to talk about the future. So when we're talking about what self-advocacy is, and we're encouraging this not just for our students, but for ourselves and our families as well, is self-advocacy is a set of skills and movements. So we talk about self-determination. We're talking about independence. College, as we know, is that time when a lot of young adults are kind of discovering who they are anyway. 
But when we talk about self-advocacy, it's really a way that we're able to empower ourselves and others to make choices that affect themselves and allow us to be independent is that we're taking control over our lives. And especially for those of us who are students with disabilities, we're probably used to our parents and caregivers being the ones who make like 90% of the decisions and that we're kind of the afterthought in that. What if we're in the driver's seat? As we know, thanks to the fact we're adults and FERPA and all that stuff, we usually are in the driver's seats when we get to higher education. But self-advocacy prepares us for it. And it also prepares us to advocate for ourselves at work and in professional settings like here as well. So that is something that means a lot to me. It's a underappreciated skill that often doesn't get taught nearly enough either. So we're gonna talk on the next slide about empowerment through self-advocacy and how we can do this so that we feel good about ourselves, that we feel like we're able to do a little bit more as well. When we talk about self-advocacy, I like to frame accommodations as a conversation. I like to do it in a way that empowers both the disabled person and the person on the other end of the request. What I like to do is fill in the blanks on a script because sometimes I don't feel comfortable disclosing either. So I might do something like, I work best when, or it would be really helpful if, so something that I'll do, it would be really helpful if a copy of the slides was available after the presentation. That doesn't tell you why I need the copy of the slides because I'm better at visual information. It doesn't tell you that I was taking notes the entire time or struggling to take notes. And therefore I might've missed something. It doesn't tell you anything about my disability. If I said it would be really helpful if, or I work best when you give me clear instructions. That doesn't tell you I'm scared to mess up, that my disability makes it that I might interpret something wrong with ambiguity or anything related to that. Or I, I know that to complete this, I might need an extra 20 minutes. Something like that doesn't really tell you all the details, but that's a way that's empowering is it gives you, the party who's being asked, context of knowing how can I help this person? How can I work with you? How can I help you be your best self? And not putting on the scary stuff of disability. But you might have to sometimes be a little bit more assertive and add that in there. But I think it's really important that we do it in that way. So for our students, it helps them share what they need and also our role in supporting them. What we can also do is think about how can we ask these questions? How can we support people and be honest about that? Something else when we talk about self-advocacy is we're making those big decisions of who needs to know about disability, how and when we disclose, if at all the pros and cons of those decisions. So you might be afraid that your peers or your professors might treat you differently or your colleagues, that it might help that they understand you and that they can help you, that you will be able to receive formal accommodations. And my favorite thing about advocacy is that it's not just limited to these situations. We could be self-advocates pushing for greater change. That is something that I do and I'm very grateful for. So I've had the opportunity to go to Tallahassee. I've had the opportunity to work within my community. I consult with different workplaces so that they are neurodiversity friendly. I do all sorts of cool stuff. And something that I learned from other self-advocates is the very first internship that I held, they had a fragrance-free policy. And I thought that was the strangest thing that I had ever heard of at first because I didn't understand why. And I was in, and being a very literal minded person, I was afraid that meant that I couldn't wear deodorant and everybody was gonna have body odor. And someone later explained to me, there was a fragrance-free policy because a previous intern had allergies and colognes and perfumes would make them act up. So it was basically a no fragrance policy in that form. And then because of my confusion, that policy would later be amended to make sure that it was clear that it was just colognes and perfumes that were what was contributory to allergies. And that this past person advocating for their needs saying that this, is help, this isn't helping my allergies, that it was able to benefit all of us was really fascinating to me. And it helped me understand that we can advocate for policies that benefit all of us. So whether it's having more time for everybody, whether it's having something like that fragrance-free policy, maybe it's pre-recording and having captions available on every single virtual meeting or class that we hold. There's so many different ways that we can use our voices to affect change and to benefit every single one of us. Which brings me to talking a little bit more about the future. So we're gonna talk about a couple more things here next. And we talk about disability often from this in neurodiversity from this deficit model, right? We think about all the things that are hard for us. I could tell you all day long about the things that are hard for us, but I wanna talk about the joy. I wanna talk about what if we took things from a different strengths-based approach that builds our self-esteem, our students and everyone around us. I am a very blunt person. 
I am not very good at a lot of the pleasantries and fluff of neurotypical conversation. If you ask me how I'm feeling, I will tell you how I'm feeling. If you ask for my opinion, you will get my unfiltered opinion. I think about being a young person and the times I've had to go shopping with friends. And my friend tries on an orange sweater. No offense if orange sweaters are your favorite sweaters in the world, but this sweater was truly atrocious. And my friend tries it on and says, well, how do I look? And I say, you look like a carrot. And she's really shocked that that's how I described her sweater and I didn't like it. And I think she expected me to say it was the most brilliant, creative, beautiful thing she had ever tried on and she should bring it home right now. And I realized that kind of hurt her feelings, but she asked me for my opinion. And then a couple minutes later, she regroups and goes, you know, thank you for telling me the truth. But that sweater really wasn't great. It really wasn't that flattering, was it? And instead of focusing on how that might've been rude, she realized I was just trying to be a loyal and honest friend to her and tell her the truth and try not to hurt her in the long run. What if we looked at it that way instead, instead of this person's being rude or blunt, maybe they're just having operating with integrity and being honest. What if when they're really obsessively joyful about something that we don't consider normal or that we think might be a little odd, we realize that person's just an expert in something that we never would have thought about or that they are deeply focused on it or that our attention to detail or how we retain facts and that we're creative. What if we focused on this stuff instead of all the stuff that's hard? What if we realized that disability is indeed diversity and neurodiversity is one of our greatest strengths? that the way that we process the world, we might be more creative, we might be able to solve new problems, we might be able to create solutions that we didn't even know we needed. Next. And just some of those things, I wanted to show what this looks like when we focus on those strengths. And think about what makes us who we are. And for neurodivergent people who are often told that something is wrong with them, or that is broken, what if we focus on the things that are making them who they are, the things that make us human, the things that make us exceptional for who we are or the things that really do make us special that isn't necessarily deserving a special treatment? What if we talk about that we're creative or the way that we think or the energy that we bring or the amount of knowledge that we have or that we're keeping it real with you or anything else about what makes us who we are? And I want to give us some takeaways on our next slide about how we can be a little bit more inclusive as well. So here's some things that I think we can do right away actually, is something that we can do is we can build vulnerability and openness with each other. Start from the top down. For those of us who are faculty members with disabilities or who are neurodivergent, and I see in the chat that some of us are neurodivergent ourselves, that makes such a huge impact, especially on young neurodivergent people like me and our students. Knowing that there's someone like you out there means so much. I didn't know anyone who was neurodivergent growing up really. I didn't really know that we'd be successful. It wasn't until I was a teenager that I met an autistic college student and said, oh my gosh, I can actually go to college someday. And that was something that really meant a lot to me. So I actually am very honest, I adjunct and I tell my students on the first day about my autism and that's why I'm teaching them in the psych department about autism and disability that it informs my experience and it also informs how they're gonna be learning. And every semester, somebody requests accommodations for some form of disability. And of course, I'm gonna grant that. I am not going to fight you on your accommodations because I understand why you're getting them and I don't need you to prove it to me because if you're sending, like proof can be a really difficult thing. And also some folks get diagnosed late. I am going to take you at your word. I want my policies to be as inclusive as everyone. So I will send everybody the recordings. Everybody gets the transcripts. If you need time, I understand. My usual thing is as long as you get everything to me by the end of the semester, but I'm usually happy. It makes a little bit more work for me but I also am very relaxed with my students in that way because it benefits my brain and hopefully theirs too. So everybody gets as much time as they end up needing. And because I let everyone know when they get their accommodations, they end up sharing a lot personally with me and with our class. I had a student who received accommodations who told the entire class on the first day after I opened up about her ADHD. And I had another student who came to me right after the first class and said, wow, I didn't realize I was part of a bigger community than myself. Thank you for not making me feel alone. It feels really great to feel represented. That's what matters is when we are open, it inspires them to be open. It inspires us to share when we've overcome 
some form of adversity or we share and bring all of ourselves and all of our identities to what we do. I also want us to match people to things they're actually good at and strengths. So let's go beyond the stereotypes. Let's go beyond what we think people are capable of or what we hope that they are. There's a stereotype in autism that all of us are computer geniuses. As you might have guessed, I am not a computer genius. I am not even the one who is running the slides today. So thank you to Juan for that. I really am truly appreciated. And I know that tech is not my greatest thing, but my past workplace always assumed it was. And I would have to run the website and all sorts of other things. And I put all this pressure on myself to perform. Just like joining all the student organizations, I wanted to make sure I was the technology goddess of my workplace. It made me miserable and scared. But when I got matched to things I actually enjoyed doing, and when I got to do things I liked or have my interests and passions incorporated, I was so much happier. That also means we have to have these conversations. They're not always easy. Talking about disability, talking about neurodiversity can be really uncomfortable for a lot of us. Let's break that down. Let's talk about things that are meaningful. Let's encourage that self-advocacy and think about how we can do this even amongst ourselves. So I challenge each of us to come up with three things about how we communicate best with one another or how other people can best communicate with you. This is something I like to do with new people that I work with is I come up with three bullet points about myself that I want them to know of how to best work with me, almost like a baby user manual. So I let people know I'm not a morning person. I let people know that I do a lot better with emails and texts and it's okay to follow up with me. If I don't get back to you, don't feel like you're bothering me if you follow up. I usually just need that extra reminder to understand that something is ex extra urgent or important. As faculty and staff and university personnel, we can also do universal design. Someone in the chat mentioned the excitement over universal design for learning, but I like to look at universal design as an everything thing, not just a learning thing. And if you've never heard of this before, it really does speak to how we design things to make them accessible to everybody, regardless of demographic factors. I usually like to use elevators as my ultimate universal design. The same with closed captions, but elevators in particular have a ton of features built into them that everybody knows where they are no matter who you are. You have the lighted up, up and down buttons that might be green or red. You have the slight tones that they make that ping high pitched or low pitched. You have the braille underneath the buttons and the lighting. And sometimes you have that robot voice that tells you exactly what floor you're on. That all encompasses so many different needs and strengths and different people that anybody can navigate the building accordingly. The same with closed captions. You might have known that they were designed for people who are deaf or hard of hearing, but a lot of us use them anyway because we need help regulating our attention, because we're struggling in some way, because we're learning a new language, because we want the extra cues that are baked into them like me. I like that they tell me if somebody is laughing, scoffing, being sarcastic, or if something's going to be dramatic. I usually misinterpret that stuff, so I appreciate the help. And finally, something that I want us to be thinking about and doing is when we are working with other neurodivergent and disabled people to encourage growth. A lot of us are seen as, well, you made it to college, you made it to a job, that's where it ends. No, 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 let's go back. We want to grow, we want to be successful, we want to be able to grow in our careers and whatnot as well. Having a mentor or feeling represented is something that's really important. It's something I've struggled with in school and beyond is finding good mentors. I always try to take in neurodivergent students under my wing whenever I have the chance and seeing us in leadership positions, whether it's in faculty, law practice, or any other place that neurodivergent people should be and belong, which is everywhere for that matter. It's a really exciting thing when we think about our future as well. I look forward to seeing how we can each lead with curiosity and how we can keep growing when it comes to neurodiversity. I'm excited to see how we continue to support ourselves, each other, and also our students. The next slide has my contact information as well if you would like to say hello to me. If you wanna visit me offline, I know that we're going to be having some time for questions, but if we don't get around to it or you just want to connect offline and not share with the group, that's totally okay. Please mention that we met here at this town hall because my inbox is black hole and I'm not always the best with strangers. So if you let me know that you are not indeed a stranger, that would be wonderful. And thank you all for your time today. Haley, I'm so glad they got to just witness having um, a true and real conversation about what it means for acceptance. It's just something that um, people who know me know I feel so deeply about equity. And what resonated with me most is that you talked about 
what it means to be your best self and how we can help each other, particularly educators, with enforcing that confidence in others. We didn't have a lot of questions that came up, but before we get into questions, if there are any, because I know time is of the essence, I just wanted to say to the decision makers on this particular format, you know, it's wonderful to actually have access to a person who is so transparent about their experience. And I think it's a teaching moment for all of us about what's important about strengths and beliefs. There was one question um, that I did see in the chat regarding how did your parents broach and discuss um, autism with you? And I don't remember who actually asked that question, but if you could address that briefly, I'd certainly appreciate it. Absolutely. And I'm actually scrolling up through the chat to, to find that question, just so I make sure I get the wording correct. That question came from Daniel Bueller. And the question was how and when my parents broached the diagnosis and how we would suggest explaining autism to children. So that is a great two-part question. My parents told me about my autism when I was nine years old. They, I was obsessed with Harry Potter at the time, so they compared it a lot to being like Harry Potter. And we talked about how Harry had magical powers and he was also someone who didn't quite fit in with the non-magic people, but also didn't fit in with the magical people too, but he was still the hero of the story. That was something that really resonated with me at nine. And it really, and my mom also said that different is neither better nor worse. It's just different and different can be extraordinary. That really resonated with me because it didn't paint me as broken or anything like that. It really did lay this foundation for this neurodiversity acceptance, even though my parents did not have that vocabulary. And I think that's something I really want to emphasize as well is in order to be a great ally and accomplice and advocate, you don't have to have this perfect social justice language. I think that's something that a lot of people get harping and hyped up on is that you need to have language down pat in order to know what you're talking about or to do the right thing. You don't. That language is just one tool in our little arsenal of being good allies. And as for explaining it to kids, I think when we talk about autism and disability, it's bringing it down to a level that feels developmentally appropriate for that person not just children. So depending on somebody's level of understanding, you might have children that are very mature. You might have people who are, struggle with understanding because of an intellectual disability or the like as well. So bringing it down to a level that is developmentally appropriate for that human being is something I would recommend. So maybe related to maybe that person thinks differently, or maybe that person wants to make friends, but might not be able to make friends in the same way that you do. There's many different ways to do this, or you can always default to something like Harry Potter, or if there's someone in pop culture that you know is autistic or that's relatable to them. So I know with our youngsters, we have Julia the Muppet, but there's so many different ways that we can have that conversation that feels appropriate to each person. Of course, when we get older and we're talking about us as adults and college students and whatnot, our, how we explain that might also be different because autism means different things to different people. There's no one presentation of autism, and that's a beautiful thing. Human diversity and disability diversity is extremely real. So that is kind of my two cents on how I would explain it, because I think everybody has a very different understanding. Thank you. I think there's one other question that we hopefully have time for, and that is you mentioned people intruding on your boundaries. Can you give some examples of how we might intrude on students' boundaries? That is a great question. Usually where people go on my boundaries is they assume I need help I don't need by just offering it. And then even if I say no, or I seem visibly uncomfortable, they still proceed anyway. And actually one of the biggest boundary violations I regularly deal with happens to be in presentations like this, actually, and people will ask me unwarranted questions about my personal life that they probably wouldn't ask to a non-disabled person. So the way that I would think about this is, would I ask this to somebody that I don't have a relationship or friendship with? People immediately will default some, for some reason to asking me if I have a boyfriend or asking me about something that seems wholly inappropriate given we probably don't know each other well enough to talk about my personal life in that regard or my romantic relationships, for instance. So that's something that happens to me and it happens a lot from people who are very well-meaning. It typically happens from people who might be like parents of autistic kids who are concerned about their children's futures. So I understand that these types of questions and types of ways that we invade on boundaries come from a good place. I think that's a really important thing to understand that when we are possibly invading or intruding on this, someone's boundary, we're not doing it from a malicious place. We're doing it because we're curious or because we think it can help our loved ones or ourselves as well. But when people set that boundary, it's really important because they're doing it with love and saying, hey, 
I just don't feel comfortable with this. That's not a slight at you. It's not an attack. And I think a lot of folks see it that way. So when someone sets that boundary, respect it and honor it and be grateful that they chose to let you know that maybe this is too much or maybe this isn't appropriate right now. Don't be the parent who shows up in my Instagram direct message and says, well, I understand, but you should still talk about this even though you don't want to because it would really help my kid. No, please do not be that person because that still hurts my feelings and tells me that my preferences aren't valid. And saying no and setting a boundary is indeed a form of self-advocacy. Well, I cannot thank you enough, Haley. I think we're at the time that we said, is that correct, Juan? You are. We have a couple more minutes. If we have another question okay. or two, like we have a two or three okay. more minutes. This is such an engaging conversation and I appreciate Haley for joining us. And Kim, this is a fantastic idea. I do want to re reiterate, if you guys have some good topics that you would like us to bring for it on this uh, platform, please send them my way, Matthew way or Mick. Uh, we'll do our best to make sure those things are addressed uh, and get in some great pre presenters like Haley. But we still have a couple more minutes if you want to move forward, Kim, with a couple more questions. Okay. But there, while there are any questions going on, um, I don't see any in the chat, um, but there were just a lot of wonderful comments. And I want to take the time to thank colleagues for being so receptive and open to the conversations. I think that um, we are challenged sometimes as educators with so many differential um, learners in the classroom at once or in our community, um, that it is hard to navigate that space sometimes. And one of the best things I think you said, Haley, is just being honest with um, yourself. I would encourage um, our colleagues to perform her, her uh, activity, which were three things that you would, you would like someone to know about yourself. Um, it's an icebreaker and it's a great way for people to understand um, your, your particular um, challenges. Everyone has them. Everyone has a space where uh, they need to be honest with other people about what makes them tick or what um, makes them uncomfortable or actually what brings them joy. So um, as we're wrapping up, Haley, do you have any final thoughts since I don't see any additional questions? No, just thank you all for being here and spending time and engaging with this topic. And thank you, Kim, for having me. It truly does mean a lot. Thank you. And thank you all for allowing ISPS to share this time with you.